Given your extensive connections and travels throughout Asia, as well as the sensitivity of our students to Asian finance, what are, in your view, the future prospects of the growth of the financial markets in Asia, their demand for financial expertise, and how can NYU Poly be part of this growth? Well, the interesting thing is until about the 18th century, China and India were the dominant global economies. They ruled the world. It's only in the last 200 years that the western side of the hemisphere of the earth began to have this economic dominance. But we're returning to long-term trends. You can see with China and India, each at over a billion in a population, each with growing economies, we're going to see a big shift in what happens around the world. The United States is still going to be a strong player. By 2050, our population in America will be about 425 million people. It will be the third largest economic entity in the world. But China and India clearly will be in front by 2050. So what does it mean for us? Well, it means, one, uh, get engaged. Be part of that growth. There's going to be a large amount of growth in both China and India, in which the expertise and the innovativeness of Americans is going to be an important part. Not the only part, but an important part. Finally, NYU Poly should, I think, do two or three things. One is clearly help build the global regulatory financial framework that allows us to have a stable, growing economy. Two is help our students understand being part of this big world, understand how China is different than the United States and the same, how India is different and the same as the United States. What, how to be an effective participant in both of those great economies, bringing something valuable and also bringing out the best in those countries. There's a lot of great talent in those countries, a lot of great ideas. So finally, I think the third piece I'd really like to see is to re-understand how to finance and amass the capital that leads to the growth that's going to take place in China. That's a big challenge, and we could help them meet that. Do you believe that the financial crisis of 2008-2009 has changed the expectations of students regarding their future? And in particular, if there is such a change, how does it alter the future strategic initiatives of our education? in uh, finance and risk engineering in the U.S. and in Asia. In particular, how can these programs of financial engineering in the U.S. confront the evolving growth of a financially savvy Asian China? Well, I think one of the things we learned from the last uh, maybe decade is that to just build wealth off of, I will call it, the financial manipulation of the operating organizations and corporations in the world is risky business. It doesn't really add to the overall well-being of the world, it adds to the well-being of the small cluster of people who do the deals, Wall Street. We now see what really counts in this world is how do we increase the value that comes out of the corporations and the innovative new businesses that are being formed all around the world, whether it's China, India, the Middle East, even Africa is beginning to see this upsurge. So how do you then take those great opportunities to increase the betterment of life and then add capital to those businesses? So in some cases, microfinance may be the key skill that you want to have. Not how to do a $100 billion transaction, but how to do a $25 transaction, but to do it a lot of times and do it well. So there's, there's a shift taking place. And of course, just understanding regulations and new regulatory environment is going to be very important. So there's going to be a real value in whether you're a financial advisor, whether you're a financial engineer or a lawyer, as I'm a lawyer, understanding all these new regulations. But the bigger opportunity really is how to build a world in which by 2050, 9 billion people on this earth, how do they have a decent life? That's the challenge. What can we do as a university and academics to institute global financial regulation? And do we need it? Yeah. Well, of course, there's a big debate going on around the world right now about uh, the level at which regulation should be reformed and how to do it. There's issues, for instance, of regulatory arbitrage. That is, if one country has loose regulations, another has strong regulations, does all the capital assembly flow to the one with the loose regulations? Clearly, we need to be careful of such uh, differing standards that we do have these flows that disappear from the places we need the money. On the other hand, I don't think every country in the world has to have identical regulations. We all have our personalities. We all have our styles. China is certainly going to approach regulation differently than the U.S. And I think India will too, because they're much different countries. But what we probably 
need to keep an eye on is can we have enough conformance among the big markets that flows of capital are not influenced by the regulatory framework, but influenced by the opportunity for growth, by the quality of the brain power that's assembling the financial opportunities, and by the, let's call it the ethical soundness uh, of the country that you're engaged with. That'll require you know, more visibility, uh, require a certain amount of global leveling. Uh, and I think it may mean that some institutions which haven't really been engaged in uh, thinking about the financial markets, let's take the United Nations, need to at least raise their hand and say, for the sake of development of the world, either we need to be more engaged, or you other institutions, World Bank, IMF, United States, China, the G20, for instance, you take this really seriously and deliver the goods, because it's our future's at stake and how will you do this? Can there be ethical behavior in finance? Is there anything we need to teach our students about ethical conduct, which is not in contradiction with their basic expectation that finance is about money and risk only, more of the former and less of the latter? Right. Well, yeah, this is a constant dilemma, right? It's really in the, it's my obligation as a CEO just to maximize revenues, let's say, for shareholders, or is there some greater calling? Well, clearly, ethical and is meaning I don't cheat and I don't lie, that's a kind of fundamental ground rule. But above cheating and lying are lots of decisions which different people might come down in different ways. And that's what we might call the land of ethical behavior in which you ask the question, what are my obligations to be a fair person? Sometimes the test is this, this Rawlsian test, which is if I traded places with you, would you be satisfied with what, how I treated you? Uh, that kind of ethical thought, I think, is important to have in one's head. And I think universities do have an obligation to not just say your role in life is to maximize return, but to think about all the stakeholders. It, I think at the first level, people expect the regulations to provide clarity, visibility, et cetera. But at the second level, they do look at the cultures of countries. And there's certain countries that everyone would be wary of doing a deal in because there's a reputation for unethical behavior. We can name some of them. I'm not going to do it now. But we could. Those countries are going to suffer in the long run on the global development scale. So it's, I think, important that each country think about how to build an ethical system, uh, certainly with a great legal framework, but even with a culture that says, I'm an honest person, I do the right thing. So you're the president of NYU Poly, which merges science and technology, with, and it's part of a broader school of NYU, which is excellent. Science, social science, policy, law. How is a financial engineering student able to weave all those things together to maximize his education? One of the exciting things about being a polytechnic is that we do have science and engineer and engineering and technology right alongside financial, engineering, and risk management. For these reasons, think of it, you're going to build most of your new opportunities in this world based on new scientific and technological breakthroughs. So as a student here, you get to mingle with the other students who are inventing new ways to use social media, new ways to use information technology. You understand the best of cybersecurity. You understand what's going on in medical biology, the future of genetics. You have this chance to be part of the scientific transformation which is taking place around the world and is key to how we solve climate problem, uh, how we solve poverty, how we create development, stability. Remember, I used to be Under Secretary of the Navy. We use a lot of technology to make a safe, stable world. Well, knowing what's going on as a financial engineer is critical with that. The second great thing that's happened is we merged with NYU. So now we're part of this global university with campuses in Abu Dhabi and campuses in Europe, South America, Asia. So as a student, you have the chance to study abroad. You have the chance to meet students that have come from abroad. And so by the time you graduate from NYU Polytechnic, you've got friends around the world who understand science and technology, you understand innovation and what's going to make the change that gives the world hope for a great 21st century. Thank you very much. Jerry Halton, yeah. president of NYU Polytechnic, thank you My for pleasure. your time. My pleasure.